Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. If you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 13. Does anyone need a pen this morning? It is. (laughs) If you're new, I apologize for any confusion that we have with uh, where we're going to be. And here's the reason why is we have been in a process. Good hands. Anybody else? Great. We're in a process of looking at what is the point of the Bible. In fact, we've been in this process since I got here a year and a half ago. And the conclusion that we've come to is that Jesus is very concerned about his kingdom. He's very concerned about bringing his righteous rule to earth. When God prepared the way, chose an insignificant and fragile people of which to fawn his love all over, and to have them be his means of proclamation to the world, with their sin hindering the furtherance of that message, he then brings about his son, promised from thousands of years before him, thousands of years before him. And in doing so, his son comes proclaiming a message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The promised people, the Jews, have rejected him as their savior. In doing so, Jesus is pronouncing an interesting type of teaching against them called parables. And the idea of a parable is, for those who were unreceptive to him, it is a message of judgment because they can't understand what he's talking about. For those who have received him, they're given even greater understanding. And what we left off with was this idea of the wheat and tares. I don't want to rehash all of that. But in order for us to understand what we're going to be dealing with today and how it works, and why our explanation of the wheat and tares is a credible biblical one that is consistent, we have to read over the interpretation. So in Matthew 13, you would look at verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. Does everybody see that? The field is the world. Mark that, because after the end of this year, when we get back into Matthew 13, we're going to pick up with that idea, and that's going to be a significant thing to know. So when I quiz you on it and threaten you with a pin to the eye if you don't know it, because we got that many pins to throw, but that way everybody would know it, right? It's good. The field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So, now watch this, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom, which means that his kingdom will be presently going on at that time. So we're talking about the 1,000 year reign of Christ, okay? He will gather out, they will gather out all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, often this has been taught in such a way for salvation. How does someone get saved? Well, that's pretty easy. Is You see, the, the whole idea is that by scattering the seed, you're going to have in the church lost people and saved people that are going to be in the church all the time, and you can't tell who is who, and everybody's looking the same. They all look like sheep. Some of them are wolves, and we start introducing all kinds of stuff. 
This passage has nothing to do with the church at all. Nothing. In fact, the idea of the church has not even been brought up yet in Jesus' ministry. He's still, he's still dealing with his pronouncement of judgment against the people of Israel because when he revealed himself, at a level more heightened than anything had ever seen before, anybody had ever seen before, they denied the Messiah, even though he fulfilled everything that had ever been promised about him in that time. All of the signs pointed to him as the promised one, and they still turned away. Or let's say it the way that John says it. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, who believed in his name, they've been given the right to be called children of God. To receive him is to believe him. The gospel doesn't change. But the heart of the Jews have become calloused with religion. How can we earn it is the idea. So here's what we saw, just leading the weeks up to it. There's going to be what's known as a remnant. And that is going to be flesh and blood, living Jewish people, humans, that at the end of the seven-year tribulation, when it seems like hell on earth, when the Antichrist looks like he is going to win and he has deceived all the nations and following them and gathering in the valley of Megiddo in the Middle East there, right north of Jerusalem, and battling together, and all the nations of the world, all their soldiers are going to be gathered to fight against Israel, that we're going to see a triumphant scene that takes place. And when the Savior returns, he is going to usher those living beings who survived that tribulation time into the 1,000-year kingdom as human beings. So we need to see all of that, how it's going to play out. So take your Bibles with me and turn to Revelation 19. You may say, well, if we're kind of studying the life of Jesus and walking through it, how come we're moving all of a sudden to the end times? Because I firmly and undoubtedly believe that that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. And it's vital for us to know, because let me say this, if you are not living today with the end in mind, you have been deceived. Too often we live day for day. Well, I'll just take whatever day the day gives me, right? Seize the day. Any carpe diem people out there? Well, here's my humble and loving encouragement to you. Stop it! Live in light of the return of the Savior. He promised he would come again, and it is going to happen. And as believers in Christ, who are not able to be ripped away from his loving, secure grip, you and I cannot afford to have our hands in the cookie jar when he comes back. So let's start in chapter 9, verse 1. I'm sorry, 19, verse 1. Forgive me. After these things... I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. And here's what they're saying. Hallelujah. Salvation, the idea of deliverance and rescue should be understood with this. And glory and power belong to our God. Why? Because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Let me say something real quick. Jesus came the first time for sin. He came as the Savior the first time, and we're going to talk a great deal about that next Sunday. That was the whole reason for his first coming. But the promise that was given by the angel to Mary was the idea of he will reign forever. He will sit on the throne of his father David. Having been crucified on a cross, buried, resurrected, and then ascended, this is still a as-to-yet-be-fulfilled promise that is waiting. Even in the announcement of his birth, the second coming was in mind. So the first time he comes, he comes to save people for their sins. He dies on the cross. What did John say? Behold, the Lamb of God that does what? Takes away the sins of only good people. Of the world, thank you. Notice that your sin is not too great for Jesus to save you because he already died for all of it. That's important. But how does he come the second time? He comes the second time to judge. 
And why is that? Is he full of grace and mercy and is he loving? Yes, absolutely he is. And I can't think of a greater way for him to extend that than saying, everybody, believe. There's nothing standing in your way except your unbelief. At this moment right here, what we're seeing, the time of grace is over. It's come to an end. And now it is time to judge. So notice the, the what do I want to say? I don't know what else to say. That, except the bold face type idea, the prominence, there's the word, the prominence of him coming to judge. Verse 2, his judgments are true and righteous. He never judges poorly. It's always exact. It's always perfect. And so the administration of his wrath poured out on a sinful, rebellious, unrepentant world is a perfect measure of exactly what they deserve. The justice of God is being satisfied because it is holding true to his word and the fact that he hates sin. Verse 3, and the second time they said, this is the multitude from verse 1, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. There is going to be praise and worship because judgment has taken place. Now you might say, man, that's kind of it's kind of brutal. It is. But because God is true, because his word is true, And because justice is happening exactly according to his truth, there's nothing else to do but to praise God in a situation like that. Why? Because he was right all along. He was always telling the truth about sin all the time. Even though Satan came about and said, Now, did God really say this? Yes, he's the inventor of language. He did say that. Get behind me, Satan. Stop messing me up. They will worship because justice has been exacted. Notice this. And the 24 elders, that's a fun conversation, and the four living creatures fell down and they worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, small and great. It's a worship service like you don't even know. Hillsong can't even capture it. I don't care. I don't see Justin Bieber in the text either, so I don't know what that's about. But some of you will get that joke. Moving on. Verse 6. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sounds of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Now pay attention, church. And his bride has made herself ready. Now let's camp on this for a second. Because there are only two types of people that are here today, saved and unsaved. So those are the two that I want to talk to today. This is the message for the saved. The bride has made herself ready. The rapture of the church is going to happen at any moment. There is nothing left to happen in all of prophecy for it to take place at any moment. You could blink, gone. And I'm not talking Kirk Cameron movie gone. I'm talking like for real, snatched up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what I'm talking about at any moment. This is why you don't want to have your hands in the cookie jar. Because here's the thing. Everybody see there, the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Let me warn you for this, church. Not every Christian is going to be ready for that time. Let me prove to you this. We're talking about people who have been faithful in their walk with the Lord. Now watch this. Look at the next verse. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. 
In the Greek, that should actually be better understood as the righteousnesses is the idea. It's the idea of righteous, but pluralized. And what is this? It's talking about our works. Your works now in your Christian life, having become a believer in Christ and awaiting the time of either death or rapture. It is a time of stewardship. Especially in America, none of us are ignorant. Why? Because we've got Bibles rolling out of our ears. I've never seen a place that has so many Bibles, and it blows my mind that when people like Hezbollah want to capture a Christian and behead them because they have Scripture found in their sandals, and here we are allowing our Bibles to gather dust on the covers. That's a scary place to be. We have such an overabundance that we have become fat and lazy about our handling of the Word. When God has already prepared beforehand good works that we should, we don't always do, should walk in them. Why? Because there's going to come a day And the question that's going to be asked after the rapture is, how did you steward your life in light of the Lord's return? Were you faithful with what I gave you? Only some of the church is going to be ready. And notice, make herself ready. Why? Because they're your works in response to the word. They are your righteousnesses that are going to merit clothing of which you get to wear special, fine linen, bright and pure. It seems like when I talk about it in clothing terms, a lot of the women pay attention. Fine linen, bright and pure, because it is going to represent how we said no to the world and how instead we obeyed the word while here on this earth. So believers, this is an important time. Notice it says here, verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this may be controversial, but I'm of the opinion that not all Christians will. Only those who are faithful. He says here, And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship who? God, not angels. Stop looking at your horoscope. Burn that trash. Worship God. He's the one full of promises and hope. He's the one who answers prayer. It's not chance. It's not fate. It's God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What in the world does that mean? Anybody want to take a stab? What does it mean? Research it. Let me know what you find out. It's not the focus of our sermon today. Verse 11. We're not here to do in-depth revelation. We'll do that some other time. Talk to Pete. Pete, what's it mean? Tell me later. All right. Verse 11. (laughs) See, Pete got scared there. I saw the sweat coming out of his forehead. Verse 11. Here it is. And I saw heaven open. Man, if you don't know it, this is the day you're waiting for. You think that it's the day after Christmas? It's not. It's this day. It's not Walmart's running everything 90% off sale. But it's really not 90%, it's only 30%. Seriously, this is the day. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, watch, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. Because diadems, they're crowns, they speak of royalty, they speak of victory, they speak of military conquest. They are what designate him as the only one that is worthy of worship. That's the idea going on. This is why John makes mention of it. And notice it's not just, man, he's wearing a big crown. No, he's wearing many crowns. Well, how is that physically possible? He's Jesus. I don't know. But it's going to be amazing. And I think we're going to be so breathtaking by being in his presence. We're not going to care how it works. We just know because of who he is, it does. 
and it eliminates all questions. Notice many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself, a special designation. He is clothed with a robe that is dipped in blood. And there could be many mentions of what in the world that means. It could be the blood that he shed on the cross is what it's dipped in. It could be the blood of the martyrs that died during the tribulation at that time. I personally think that when he sets down his feet on the Mount of Olives, his robe is going to be filled with blood because of all the destruction he brings against the people who hated him and would not respond to his grace. Just give you a different picture of God. Just give you a different picture of Jesus. Everybody notice he's not 70s hippie Jesus. It's not Ringo Starr with long hair. He's here to judge and to make war. He's here to deal with the problem. He makes all things right. Notice, his robe is dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Where did we see that? Saw it beforehand, didn't we? And what is that bright, fine, clean linen? What is it? It's our works. And when our works are evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ, it will determine whether or not we receive robes or not, crowns or not, privileges or not, responsibilities or not. And or not is a possibility for a life that is squandered. There are plenty of people who have a relationship with God. There are few people that are in fellowship with Him. And this is why we stress this. Because the saved need to get saved. And if the saved would get saved, we'd have a lot easier time getting the lost saved. There's a lot of us that respond quite nicely to a message or feel enlightened by a verse. There are few that are willing to take up their cross and follow Jesus and deem him worthy and more valuable than anything else that this world tries to shove in our face at only a 23.9 interest rate. We are too easily pleased, church. And at this moment, when it's all going to come down to the wire, when it's going to be worth it, the hard time, staying faithful, remaining true, upholding God's word, adoring him, waiting on him to solve a situation instead of charging ourselves into debt, instead of petitioning for a politician to be the difference. Our world is in a scary state, guys. We're dealing with a lot of scary things. Everything is changing except our God, except his word, except the gospel. They don't change. Therefore, there is no reason to let go of them. Hold fast. Because when he rips through that sky, when it rolls up like a scroll, and the people of the earth see Christ face to face, and they have no pardon, to excuse their rebellion. This is the moment where it's going to matter in eternity. So notice, the clothed in fine linen, white, clean. They were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Jesus, why do you have a sword in your mouth? I'm glad you asked. With it, he may strike down the nations, the Gentiles, the pagans. How does this settle, man? Jesus is going to return, and when he rips through the clouds, the first thing he is going to do is kill people who deserve it. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? Grace has run out. There will be a time in history when grace stops. Do we realize that sometimes this wanton idea that we have of God and we're kind of him hauling on a ship in our Christianity, do we not realize that there comes a time when it's over? It's done. It's time to move on to the next thing. We spent too long caring about ourselves that we didn't care for the lost people around us. I'm so tired of this. Well, we can't say anything. We might get in trouble. Anybody read Acts? Everybody got in trouble in Acts. 
Why? Because there's no other name, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Because we can't shut up about what we've seen and heard. If we do, we are disobedient. What did Jeremiah said? If I don't tell the message, it's like a fire in my bones. I've got to get it out. I can't hold on to it. Does that resonate at all? If it doesn't, be fearful. It might be a concern to wonder, God, why doesn't your word want to bubble up and bubble over into the people around me? There's something hindering it. It doesn't take a shrink to figure out what it is. It's sin. The problem is sin. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace.